The city of Pergamon, located in the region of Anatolia, that is modern-day Turkey, was founded on a steep ridge that's one of the most naturally defensible spots all around the Mediterranean. It was selected for its defensive capabilities as the perfect location for his treasury by King Lysimachus. Now, Lysimachus was one of the Greek successors who carved up Alexander the Great's empire upon his death in 323 BC. Now, Lysimachus placed his treasury here and placed Philetaris, who had apparently previously served in his army, in charge of the treasure. This is a treasure of about 9,000 talents of silver. In modern terms, that's about 513,000 pounds or 234,000 uh, kilograms of silver. Um, if you figure about silver at oh, around $20 an ounce, what we have in modern terms is a treasure of about just over $160 million. Now, of course, in antiquity, that would be worth far more because of the economy, there's less to buy, slave labor, and so forth. So what we're talking about is a vast sum of money. And um, Lysimachus placed it here, all safely secured at Pergamon. Now, to ensure that Philetaris didn't get any ideas about founding his own kingdom, according to most reliable sources, Lysimachus had him castrated. Now, that may have stopped him from thinking about starting a family, but it's not an act that's likely to foster loyalty. And in fact, Philetaris revolted from Lysimachus and declared his independence and that of Pergamon in 282 BC. He actually caught a break in his revolt when Lysimachus was killed in battle in 281 BC, followed shortly by the death of the only other Greek king who could try to assert control over Pergamon. So Philetaris ruled his new kingdom from Pergamon until his death in 263 BC, establishing the city as a regional power base. Well, not having his own children, for obvious reasons, he adopted his nephew, Eumenes I, who succeeded him as ruler of Pergamon upon Philetaris' death. Eumenes was succeeded by Attalus I, who ruled from 241 to 197 BC. And from his name, the dynasty gets its designation, the Attalids. So what we have is an independent kingdom founded shortly after, just two generations after the death of Alexander the Great, um, the kingdom of Pergamon and its rulers, the Attalids. Well, I think there's nothing like insecurity to make someone overcompensate. Examples from history abound, from the kings of Naples, who tried to create their own palace of Versailles to compete with the kings of France, to Kim Jong-il and his cult of personality in North Korea, to you know, that young guy down the street from me who won't put a muffler on his car. Okay, that last example may not be of the same magnitude. Still, it's the same tendency. For the rulers of Pergamon, that tendency manifested itself in their decision to create a grand city that was, in many ways, designed to be the cultural successor of Athens. Now, I should stop here and, and point out that this is our interpretation of what they attempted to achieve. They could, in fact, have been looking at Athens as a model and themselves as the successors of Athens, or they could simply have been trying to compete with Athens and really um, effectively create something that is Athens but better. We think that really they're looking at Athens as a model and trying to see themselves as the next Athens, as the successor to Athens. Whatever their thinking was, they weren't thinking small, that's for sure. Athens was most certainly the cultural model for the Greeks. Not that uh, the designers of Pergamon based the plan for their city directly on Athens, but they created a number of visual and architectural connections that made it clear that they were the cultural inheritors of Athens. In this way, the Attalids set themselves up as the competitors of the Ptolemies in Alexandria who had the same idea. It's hard not to believe that the unknown planner who designed Pergamon had at least read about uh, the architect and planner Denocrates of Rhodes. Denocrates, the, 
the man who was responsible for the layout and design of Alexandria, is, I think, most famous for his great, uh, his great vision for Mount Athos in Greece. He had, he had proposed to Alexander the Great to carve the mountain into a form of a man with a city in one outstretched hand and the river pouring out of the other one. This was a great idea, completely impractical. In fact, Dinocrates, when he founded Alexandria, uh, used a fairly, at the time, conservative and typical plan, using a well, orthogonal planning for it. Pergamon is, at least in its upper city, bold, dramatic, and aggressively anti hippodamian That is, it's a rejection of the hippodamian orthogonal planning that we've seen earlier, and that extends both to the layout of the city and its underlying ideology. You see, Hippodamus, when he laid out Miletus and the cities that followed, was in fact um, a great proponent of democracy. And one of the things that he did was he laid out the city in the form that, for example, in all the residential areas, every block and therefore every house was exactly the same size. It's a democracy. All men are created equal. And in the center of Miletus were all of the great public buildings needed for a democracy and the, um, the city market. So what you have is in the center of the city all the things that create it as a democracy, that define it, really, as a democracy. Well, here at Pergamon, there's nothing democratic or constitutional about it. The entire upper city, with its military, administrative, leisure, and religious spaces, certainly reflects the community but it mainly reflects the personal identity and beliefs of the Adelaide monarchs. The city design is based on a series of terraces that seem to have grown out of the rugged landscape of this very steep cliff. The buildings and spaces themselves are grouped in dramatic diagonals on these terraces, not using a Hippodamian plan. What this does that is, the plan of Pergamon, is it builds on a mastery of siting buildings on terraces and on a complex structure that prioritizes interest in the organic whole over a single feature. In other words, by comparison, or frankly by contrast, we have, well, the Acropolis at Athens, dominated by the Temple of Athena, uh, the Parthenon. It has that one feature high up that dominates the entire city that's used to define it culturally and architecturally. Here at Pergamon, we don't have that single feature. We have a variety of, of features, of buildings and spaces that grow out of the sides of this tremendous ridge. The design here could be described as freely articulated urbanistic planning. Not only could it be, I just did. Well, this emphasis on theatricality, great scale and size, drama, the approach, and the distant view, all together are intended to evoke a sense of wonder in the viewer. That wonder, or a similar emotional response, was a key goal of Hellenistic design. This is the period where people are compiling, for example, lists of the great wonders of the world, buildings that create a sense of awe in those who view them. And so that notion of the visual, of that visual effect by the viewer from a distance or on the approach, is a key element to Hellenistic design. You were supposed to be overcome with this great sense of awe at these buildings. Um, they're not, in fact, human scale. They're not anything that you, you think of as, as approachable. They are, in fact, in, intended to create that sense of wonder that then is transferred to those who have designed and those, frankly, who have commissioned the buildings. You look at Pergamon and you think of the greatness of the Adelaide monarchs. That's the idea. Well, we encountered an early example of that notion of wonder at the Pharos, the great lighthouse at Alexandria, which was designed with the same intentions. In a lot of ways, you could see that as a precursor to Pergamon. Here at Pergamon, it's not just one building, it's the entire city that was conceived using much the same concept of wonder. Each building in the upper city sits alone, sometimes with a colonnade behind it, framing it from behind, each one on a terrace so it can be viewed from a distance. But the true focus is on the aggregate effect of the entire set of buildings and monuments in the upper city. Hippodamus 
never attempted to evoke a sense of wonder in his designs. In fact, he rejected the idea of modifying his layouts to take the actual landscape into account. It's the antithesis of evoking wonder. In fact, I'd go further and suggest that the concept hadn't even been applied to cities before this period. This is something new to the Hellenistic period. Now, I have to say that the reliance on Hippodamian planning for the lower city at Pergamon demonstrates the tenacity of that practical form of city planning, even giving the application of the dramatic um, to the upper buildings, uh, to the public buildings in the upper city. Once again, despite the amazingly steep and sheer sides of the ridge, Hippodamian planning was applied here without regard for topography, just as it had been at Miletus and most notably at Ephesus. We're not going to look at much or talk about much of the lower city because we don't have much of it available to study. But I wonder actually about the necessary adjustments of those living on streets that rose up, not just a hill, but up the side of a cliff, and what their houses must have looked like. I'm guessing lots of terracing like the houses at Ephesus, or maybe even stilts. Um, it's quite possible, well, I could quite imagine, that the designers didn't care about the practical effects. They laid out that lower city, and if you had a ladder, if you had to have a ladder to move from one room to another in your terrace house, that's the way it was. It really does move up a sheer cliff face. It's pretty extraordinary in its design and its really rejection of any consideration of the natural. Well, by contrast, many of the buildings in the upper city are dramatic. The building types that we find are familiar from other earlier Greek cities. What I think is behind, or actually beneath, the design of the upper city is seen in the, in the um, overall structure. All of the upper terraces seem to fan out visually from the lines of the theater, which seems appropriate given the emphasis on dramatic presentation found at the site and, in fact, throughout Hellenistic design. We can't say if this was a deliberate reference, if there's a transference here in the idea of the theatric theatrical or dramatic from the theater building to these upper buildings, but certainly the theater building itself seems to anchor the terraces of the upper city, which are connected to it visually. This theater, which marked the base of the upper city, held perhaps 10,000 people, and it had the steepest seating area of any theater known from the ancient world. That makes sense because, well, it's built on the side of a cliff. Above it, among the monuments and buildings that we find on the upper city were various temples, including a temple of Athena and one of Dionysus, the royal palaces of the Adelid monarchs. Again, as mentioned before, building types in cities reflect the needs of government. And we also have shrines to the worship of the Adelid kings, because the, the kings, once they died, were deified and worshipped here. We also have an upper agora, a large common area, and arsenals with weaponry and, and, and barracks for the military, and things like this. The Temple of Athena, I think, is particularly significant because it's dedicated not just to Athena, but to a particular aspect of Athena, Athena Nikephoros, that is, Athena the victory bearer, the bearer of Nike. The name and the form of the temple are very familiar because it's based on the Temple of Athena Nike or the Temple of Athena Nike on the Athenian Acropolis, one component of that great Periclean building program from the Golden Age of Athens in the 5th century BC. The visual of Athena as a literal bearer of victory, I think, refers directly to the Chris Elefantine statue of Athena Parthenos in the Parthenon. In that statue, Athena is standing in the temple, literally holding victory in her outstretched hand. So what we have here are multiple layered and specific references to two important and influential temples of Athena from Athens. And this is sort of typical of Hellenistic design, which created many works that referred to classical antecedents, but do so in a way where you have these layered identities and multiple references. And here, rather than one reference or 
actually a quotation. There's an attempt, I think, to outdo what came before. Um, those multiple references really create something that's intended to emulate, in the ancient sense, to, to outdo um, the Athenian. Of course, why draw comparisons to or compete with one Greek cultural center when you can draw them to two? The great library at Pergamon, also in the upper city, was built to compete with the library at Alexandria. And it, in fact, quickly became the second largest library in the Greek world, with reputed holdings of 200,000 books. Now, this is an amazing number when you consider that each book had to be copied by hand and on materials that were only available from one place on Earth, the papyrus growing in the Egyptian delta. Now, the Ptolemies of Egypt were aware of the risk of losing their cultural supremacy and the bragging rights of having the largest library, and so they called for an embargo and stopped exporting papyrus for scrolls, thinking that that would stop the Pergamines from copying books and ensure that their library at Alexandria stayed the largest. In response, the people of Pergamon, under the orders of Eumenes II to find an alternate material, invented parchment, that is, treated animal skin, which became the most common material for books throughout the ancient and medieval worlds. I think, interestingly enough, we see papyrus becoming another sort of cultural marker for competition later on when the kings of Naples um, excavate the areas of uh, Pompeii and Herculaneum and come upon papyrus scrolls from a library there and then use them as cultural capital to trade with the kings around Europe. So we see, really, I think it's interesting that these ancient books, both in antiquity and after they're rediscovered, become this really privileged cultural material. Well, the library at Pergamon, as an important building in the upper city, was lavishly decorated on the interior. Uh, the interior is lined with slabs of marble. Um, there are statues at, with, the, with the names of great scholars around um, the walls of the library. But the focus of the decor was a statue of Athena Parthenos, a copy of the one in the Parthenon in Athens, of course, and another one of those that we know of that spread throughout the Greek world. Well, of all of the monuments in the upper city, none is quite as dramatic as the great altar of Pergamon built from 180 to 150 BC. The altar doesn't seem to have been dedicated to any god in particular, although some misguided souls, scholars, refer to it as the great altar of Zeus for no good reason. I think instead, actually, that it was dedicated to all the Olympian gods and believe, I have to admit with no hard evidence, that it was inspired by the altar of the 12 gods in the Athenian Agora, which was dedicated the altar of the twelve gods, to all of the Olympian deities, who incidentally were the same we find sculpted on the east, that is the front pediment of the Parthenon. Actually, it's not the altar itself that's important, but the surrounding wall that takes our attention. The altar is surrounded by a great wall that defines the sacred precinct, and whose exterior base is covered with a single relief frieze. This frieze is about 2.28 meters in height and 110 meters long. Compare that to the continuous frieze on the Parthenon, which is about 160 meters long. So this is actually the second largest piece of continuous relief sculpture ever made in ancient Greece. It's composed of over 200 figures, of which over 100 are named with inscriptions. We have Greek gods above and giants below them locked in a battle called the Gigantomachy, the battle of the gods against the giants. This is the same subject that filled part of the exterior sculpture on the Parthenon, just in case you had any doubts that they're drawing more comparisons here. I don't think that's a coincidence. The altar at Pergamon, however, is carved in a radical new Hellenistic style, referred to as Pergamese Baroque that combines dramatic compositions and overblown proportions with almost incredible attention to detail in carving. Muscles, skin, um, fingernails, and individual locks of hair of the gods and the giants are all carved in really extraordinary detail. The depth of the carving on the figures is one of the most notable traits, especially in the hair and the musculature. 
not only are they carved, well, they're not just carved in relief, they're carved in really high relief, as though they're bursting out of the background. These, all these details and the heightened musculature and the large figures work to create emotionally exciting groups that are designed to evoke pathos from the viewer. Pathos, meaning just emotion in the Greek. As the giants are along the bottom of the relief, they're closest to the viewers who could easily see them in defeat. I think that's particularly significant. Because some of these giants plead for mercy and others suffer from the effects of the attack of the gods with thunderbolts from Zeus through their thighs or being torn apart by animals or in one particularly horrific case having a lit torch shoved in his face. What we see in this is the emphasis on the emotional suffering of the enemy giants, and it's completely unprecedented in Greek art. Much of the conception here, in fact, seems to be based not on previous Greek art, but on the antecedents of Greek tragedy. It's hard not to think of Aristotle here and his notion that the goal of tragedy was to evoke a catharsis, an emotional cleansing on the part of the audience. I think that's the goal here as well. You, as the audience, view this and see these horrific scenes of emotional devastation on the part of the figures that are closest to you, and it's supposed to evoke these feelings which then are purged from your system. The audience, therefore, seems invited to consider the emotional pain of the conquered, and perhaps to identify with them. It's hard to know exactly, but I think it's worth considering that notion of identification, as we'll return to it in a moment. Interestingly, the only testimony to the importance of the great altar in antiquity comes from the book of Revelation. It's commonly believed, that is, by more than just scholars, that the reference to the throne of Satan in Revelations 2, 12 to 13, refers to the great altar. In the book of Revelation, it says, And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and even hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. I find this testimony from the 90s A.D., uh, Antipas was was martyred in 92, um, fascinating, as we believe that the forms of the giants on the altar, especially their half-human, half-animal elements with snakes for legs and great wings, inspired medieval images of demons. Well, among the most prominent of the Greek gods on the great altar frieze is Athena, crowned by by Nike, or in ancient Greek, Nike, the personified victory. We have winged victory here, crowning Athena herself. I think the references to Athens hardly need to be stated. Speaking of which, another prominent feature on the altar is Zeus battling giants. The forms of Athena and Zeus on the great altar frieze are based on, in fact, they are exact visual quotations from the pediment figures of those gods on the Parthenon. Now, the altar is a traditional type of victory monument slash religious dedication, using myth as metaphor, and the gods to stand for the mortal Greeks, battling the giants who stand in for barbarian enemies. But at Pergamon, we also see a new type of victory monument. Attalus I won a series of battles against the Gauls of Northwest Asia Minor, modern Turkey. After the final victories against the Gauls in 220 BC, he created a set of victory monuments. Nothing new there. But these victory monuments were different in form and placement from anything that had come before. First, he made two sets of sculpture groups. One was set up at Pergamon and the other at Athens connecting these two cities again. Both sets were dedicated to Athena Nikephoros, um, the, the, Athena, the victory bearer. In form, they're unprecedented, and I should tell you, still not fully understood. What's extraordinary about them is they lack any representation of victors, as was, and frankly still is, standard. 
There's no monumentalization. There's nothing that seems to celebrate war. No adelid monarchs on rearing horses or anything of the sort. Instead, the sculptural groups of these victory monuments consist entirely of figures of the Gallic enemies. These ennoble the defeated with emphasis on the heroism of a defeated but honorable enemy. Now, it's certainly true that in antiquity, people went to great pains to celebrate the greatness of their enemies. There's no trash talking in antiquity. The theory here is that the greater one's enemy, the greater one's victory. And so you don't denigrate your enemy because that would lessen your victory. But these sculptures go far beyond anything else ever conceived. The sculptures consist entirely of dead and dying Gauls, including one standing up and committing suicide following their defeat in battle. The goals of the sculpture are emotional excitement and empathy in the audience, elicited using rhythm and fluid compositions. The underlying intentions seem to be based on those, again, of Greek tragedy, and they're designed to move the audience rather than to inform or enlighten. This art places emphasis on the emotional reaction and engagement of the viewer whose pathos, emotional response, is provoked. I think it might be a useful exercise to pause and consider what the likely reaction of the general public would be if presented today with victory statues depicting modern defeated war enemies dying and committing suicide. Would it be seen as bloodthirsty, insufficiently patriotic, deeply empathic? We we don't know. Um, But I think it's an interesting idea. Um, When you see the forms of a victory monument or a memorial to war, it tells you something, I think, about about the zeitgeist, about the, the, the contemporary cultural ideas in that community. Pergamon also provides a wonderful segue to Roman cities, which we'll explore in the next few lectures, as it was taken over by Rome in 133 B.C. Actually, I say it was taken over by Rome in 133 B.C. It was, but most interestingly, actually, um, it wasn't just taken over. The last king of Pergamon willed the, the kingdom of Pergamon to the Roman people. He left it to them after his death, and um, the people of Rome took over the city, took the treasury back to Rome, and its statues of the Gauls, or at least many copies of them, ended up in the city of Rome, where some of them are to this day. It's it's only in Rome, not Pergamon, where one can see the famous dying Gaul and the suicidal Gaul in museums. Other statues from this group are housed in the National Archaeological Museum in Naples, where they went as part of the collections of the kings of Naples, thanks to the dowry of Elizabeth Farnese, a Roman princess who married one of the kings of Naples and brought these sculptures from Rome to Naples. We don't know if these are copies, or as some scholars think, the originals which were brought here from Pergamon or perhaps from the set in Athens. Nevertheless, I think that they give us a great sense of that cultural transference to Rome. Another example of that is in the library of um, Pergamon. Its 200,000 volumes were actually transferred to the library at Alexandria by Mark Antony, who gave them to Cleopatra as a wedding gift, um, really closing the library at Pergamon and ensuring the greatness and continuation of the library at Alexandria as the major Greek library. Well, Pergamon illustrates the rich variation of city design from antiquity. It's not all either hippodamian planning or just organic growth. But here we see a truly new alternative form of city that emphasizes the appearance and emotional response of the viewers. Pergamon's monuments and public buildings were designed to create multiple references to the Athens of the Golden Age of Pericles. The Parthenon and Temple of Athena Nike from the Athenian Acropolis were repeatedly cited in sculptural subject and architecture, and Pergamon competed with Alexandria to be considered the new cultural center of the Greek world as well. In many ways, we could consider Pergamon as similar to Washington, D.C., as an example of a city created as deliberate inheritance from older cities and civilizations that it emulated.